Great. Thanks, everyone. So um, got, I'm an engineer at Forward Networks. So we've seen a, a lot of really exciting work today on uh, next generation data point technology. And we're going to take a brief break from, from that kind of stuff and step back uh, from the switching elements and think about the network as a whole. So in particular, I'm going to tell you about how you can run a query. Um, how you can query your network like a database and why you would want to do that. And the talk basically has two parts. In the first part, I'll talk about what it means to query your network and why you'd want to do that. And then in the second part, I'll talk about how we actually built a system to do that in some of the largest and most complex networks in the world today and the lessons that we learned along the way. Okay, so what does it mean to query a network like a database? Well. I'd like to explain that by way of a story about a large service provider uh, that came to us for help with an interesting problem. So in this setting, there are two networks. This is both, part of this, both of these networks are part of a single service provider, but they're operated by different groups uh, within that service provider. And there's an upstream network and a downstream network. And these are very complex networks in their own right, but I'm just focusing on two devices here. So there's a a pair of BGP routers that are peering with each other. Uh, U, that's the upstream BGP peer, and D is the downstream peer in the downstream network. So, um, and basically D is advertising routes up to U, and then U is distributing that throughout its network and to the rest of the internet. So this seems like a completely plain vanilla, simple BGP use case. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot of things, it turns out. So. Um, basically, particularly the upstream router may have import filters that the downstream router is not aware of. Uh, there may be filtering on, say, AS, so community values or AS paths. There's basically a variety of policies that could be in place there, and the downstream uh, administrators might not be aware of this. And so what could happen is that um, if D starts to advertise a route using one of these community values or a particular pattern for the AS path, it could be inadvertently filtered by the upstream router. And if this happens, then uh, its advertisement will be filtered out, dropped, and traffic won't flow to the desired prefix. So that's not good, but it turns out that this gets a little worse. The problem is a little worse because um, in this network, there's actually two pairs of these peers. Um, at any, so U1 and D1, and then U2 and D2. And at any given time, um, one is active and primary, and one is a backup and is not carrying traffic. And so if this bad import policy that you know, people have forgotten about exists only in the backup upstream BGP router, then the problem might go unnoticed for a long time. And you might only uncover it during a failover scenario, which would be very confusing. So this is a service provider, so there are SLAs. And um, so when this happens, it can be expensive. I've simplified the problem a bit, but it is not theoretical. Like this is an actual problem that has happened in the past, and it's bit this router. So it's a particular pain point. Well, so the good news is that the operators have you know, found the root cause of this problem. They have an idea of what they can do to solve the problem. And it's actually really simple. Basically, their plan is to uh, proactively detect this problem as soon as it occurs by monitoring the advertised, getting the advertised BGP routes from the downstream neighbors, the downstream P, uh, BGP router, D, getting the IPv4 FIB from the upstream router, and then comparing and finding advertised routes that are not installed at U. As soon as this happens, they have a problem and they can proactively address the problem. So it's a simple, a simple idea, it's important, and yet this is actually very hard, very challenging for them to implement this simple idea. And the reason is the scale and diversity in their network. So this, I showed you one network. This is actually replicated many, many times over. And so they have a diversity of, of vendors, of operating systems, and operating system versions. And so getting at this data is non-trivial. So there are some APIs you know, that might help here. Like we've, talked, we've heard about GNMI, there's NetConf. Um, you know, if you have good Yang models. But these are not widely or uniformly supported on the devices that are deployed today and in the foreseeable future. So the only workable solution for them was to write programs that SSH to these devices, run commands, grab all this text, 
parse all this poorly documented text, organize the data set, and on and on and on, right? And um, this is a huge effort. So to just give you a very quick sense of what's involved in doing something like this, um, if you wanted to, say, get the interface status for some of the networks, some of the devices in your network, let's say a Cisco NXOS device and an A10 device, you'd have to run different commands on the two boxes, right? One device you'd run two commands, the other one you run one command, and the outputs of these commands are completely different. And so you have to write parsers for completely different formats. And so, um, and secondly, you've got a maintenance problem here because these are poorly, these are not, there's no spec for these things. And so you have to guess you know, what the spec might be when you write your parser. You know, something is showing up on the third line of each block, whatever. You, you come up with some, some uh, generalization, some inference here, but you're probably wrong. And when, you know, the device is put in some different configuration, it might print things differently, and then your parser breaks. So this is not just, the problem is not just implementing it once for the devices you have now, but it's maintaining this over time for, you know, hundreds or, uh, of data points. And so um, this situation is not isolated to just this one service provider. We've heard this over and over again. So we had another network operator that wanted to do, say, just check some simple things like interface status and BGP session status. And they estimated that it would take them, they would have to dedicate an engineer for six months to do, to build these, to check these uh, conditions. And that 80% of that work was just collecting and parsing data. And that's terrible because it just feels like such a waste. Basically, every operator is going and parsing all this data, and it's completely generic. So, um, but actually, most of these checks, actually, the work just doesn't get done because operators are busy. They're solving problems, other problems, and they're not programmers. You know, they don't spend all their time programming, so it's hard to build this kind of system. So this approach of having each operator implement all this low-level code is just not working. And so we thought, okay, let's take a step back here. You know, what if we thought about we took a thought about this as a database problem? You know, what if we just had a database of network information and you could just query it? Okay. So if you had that database, then the service provider's problem would actually be really simple. It would just amount to formulating a reasonably simple query. Like are there any BGP routes that are advertised by my downstream BGP routers that are not installed in the upstream routers uh, FIB? Right, that's a lot easier than having to write huge piles of low-level SSH and parsing code. And from talking to other network operators, we've come across a lot of other kinds of queries that people would, be, would find very useful to run. Things like just ad hoc questions, like you know, where have we defined VLAN 100? Um, or um, specifying desired invariants in the network, like do all my connected interfaces, interfaces use the same MTU? Or looking for specific bad states, like you know, are any of my expected BGP sessions in a bad state or down? So if we could query the network like a database, then answering these questions would be uh, easy. And so we built forward a network query engine, or NQE, to provide this capability. So forward, forward NQE provides access to structured, normalized data about the network so that users can query their network like a database. And at a high level, the basic idea is that the forward platform takes in, uh, collect, goes out and collects data from all these devices in the network, um, collects a lot of variety of kind of vendor-specific uh, uh, data sources. They might be various text files from command outputs, takes all these, parses these, and then organizes that into a structured and normalized data model. And by structured, I mean that it's fully parsed. So we're not taking, say, just the text output from some command and dumping it into a string, but we're fully parsing it. So an interface is represented as a record or an object that has a bunch of attributes. Eventually, you drill down through those attributes. They're all structured. You get to leafs. For example, like an MTU is actually a number in this model. It's not just a string that you then have to parse. So the point is you don't have to parse anymore. And the second point is that it's normalized. And by that, we mean that um, it's vendor-neutral representation. So for example, 
data about an interface is organized the same, about interfaces is organized the exactly same way if you're looking at a Cisco router or an A10 load balancer. And then finally, we've added a query API on top of this so that uh, clients can ask for exactly the subsets of the data that they need. That allows them to, for example, ask for just the interface information, just inf interface states. So that enables uh, you to query the network like a database. And a key point of that normalization is that a single query will work across your entire network regardless of what you have in that network. And we support a lot of the devices that are out there today. Okay, so with that background, I'll dive uh, a little into a little bit more detail and walk through solving the service provider's use case with NQE. And as a reminder, the service provider problem that we're talking about here involves essentially doing two queries, getting two pieces of data, the advertised BGP routes from the downstream neighbor uh, router and then the IPv4 fib from the upstream neighbor, and then comparing these to find violations. Okay, so this is the forward network's UI, and what you're seeing here is a network at a snapshot in time. And this is a very simple network that I've, I've stripped down to just those two devices that we're talking about. So there's a Cisco device that's acting as the upstream router and a Juniper device that's acting as the downstream uh, router. The UI provides a, an access, uh, access to a ton of functionality that I'll completely ignore in this talk. I do encourage you to go you know, check out forward networks and see all the stuff that it can do. It's, it's amazing. Um, but I'm just going to focus on what happens when you click, click on one little blue link down on the left-hand side called GraphQL. That brings up the NQE editor. And this allows you to um, develop. This is a UI for developing and running queries. So on the left-hand side, you've got um, an editor where you can write queries. And then in the middle, you've got a results pane. So if you click that execute button, you'll see results show up here. This is JSON results. And then on the right-hand side, you've got um, in editors data model documentation. So you can know, so you can browse the data structure right there. And this editor, so this query right here is a GraphQL query. And I'll go into a little bit more detail what that is. Um, but the main idea here is that the data model is essentially um, objects and attributes. Okay. And the query is just specifying um, which attributes are of interest that it, you're trying to get at. Okay, so for example, what it's saying is, um, let's get the devices attribute of the root object, and then within, for each of those devices, that's a collection of devices, for each of those you get the name attribute, and the platform attribute, and from the platform attribute you get the OS attribute. So that's all it's saying. It's just saying what are the attributes of interest. Then you run the query and you get JSON, which is basically following exactly the same structure of the data model, just with values filled in. Okay, so here's the uh, first query that we need to write for the service provider use case. And I won't go through all the details, but essentially what's happening here is you're drilling down through those attributes, you know, asking for the devices, going into the BGP rib, eventually getting down to the BGP routes, getting the prefixes and other attributes that are needed for doing this use case. So you're just drilling down. It might look a little bit daunting, but it's actually fairly straightforward to write. The editor has some really nice features like auto-completion, so it makes it pretty easy to, to write these. Um, so then you run it, and then you get your BGP routes um, in the middle. So you can experiment with it, interactively build, in, build a query like this. So that's the first one. So here's, and then we come to the second query. Here's the second query um, to get the IPv4 routes, and it's essentially very similar in, in style, in flavor. Um, this time we're going into a different part of the hierarchy called network instances, down into the forwarding tables, getting the IPv4 routes. But essentially it's, it's very similar. Okay, so we take those two queries. We now write a simple, small script. Um, that runs both of those queries, gets the routes from those two queries, and then finds you know, which routes, advertised routes, are missing in the IPv4 fib, prints out a table of violations. All right, so this is a fairly small program. Um, it's a, not a trivial amount of work, but it's much simpler than it used to be. So the key point is that 
this allows this service provider to implement this in you know, an afternoon as opposed to six months that it might have taken before. So um, this makes it a lot easier. OK, so how do we actually implement a, network, a normalized network database? In theory, this is really simple. Right? It just, you go to the devices, you collect some data, you parse that data, you norm, or analyze it and normalize it a little bit, and then you put a query API on top of it. So it seems fairly straightforward, but in practice, there are challenges at every step of, of this process. And uh, the collection and parsing parts of this process are sort of core parts of the forward platform. They're at the heart of, or the, the precursor to everything we do in the forward platform. And then the steps of normalizing and querying are things that are specific to supporting querying the network like a, like a database. And I'll spend a lot more time talking about these latter parts, the normalization and query, and I'll just touch on briefly what we had to do to collect and parse as well. And I'll work my way backwards, so I'll start with that first thing, the querying. So for a query API, we really wanted to, um, we wanted an, an API that is easy to use and um, requires minimal learning. And so especially since network operators are you know, not um, spending all day programming for the most part. And so other choices may have worked, but uh, GraphQL was a great fit for this purpose. The motto of GraphQL is a query language for your API. Um, it was developed by um, Facebook in 2012 and then open sourced in 2015. Has gained a lot of traction since then. You can think of it a little bit like somewhere in between a REST and SQL. So like REST, it allows you to request and receive data across a web connection. Um, like SQL, it um, provides a way for the server to describe a data, its data model, like a schema, in a precise way. And then it provides a query language so that clients can ask for specific parts of that data model. So that allows a server to say what data it has and clients to use that data model in a data set in a flexible way. So at the bottom left, here's a tiny little example here. Um, so the schema language looks roughly like this. It's essentially objects with attributes. And those attributes have types and so on. Okay? And um, then the queries are very simple. They're basically just picking out you know, attributes from this data model. So here you're, you're taking the project and then choosing the tagline of the project. And then the, um, the results are just JSON following the structure of the data model. So it's, it's very simple. And the schema language was, um, is simple, and, but powerful enough for us. And that's a key ingredient for us. Um, the data model that we have is very elaborate. There's a lot of data points. It's deeply nested. Um, and so users really need a way to find out what's there, to know what they're programming against and the data set that they can rely on. So for example, here's a, a small fragment from our data model. So this is defining some e an ethernet uh, object. And you can see how it's defining a bunch of fields or attributes like MAC address and duplex mode and so on. Each of those has a specific type that you can go and drill into and look at. Um, and there's informal documentation on, on all of it. Um, there's a really strong open source ecosystem around GraphQL as well. And so that, so that we've gotten a lot of good tooling for GraphQL. So that editor you saw that is built on top of open source tools. The, it, the fact that it provides auto completion and all kinds of editing support um, is, you know, comes along with having a precise schema that it can build on. So we leverage all that great work. So another key advantage of GraphQL is that it's very intuitive to query and consume the results. So I showed you these examples of queries. Essentially, there's no syntax here. The only syntax you see is curly braces. Right? It's incredibly easy to get started with this. And then the output is incredibly simple, too, because it's essentially just you know, your query with values filled in. Um, and finally, GraphQL. Um, Makes, makes it rather easy to implement our server, especially to, in order to deal with the scale of the, the sort of the complexity, the size of the networks that we're dealing with, where some of the devices that we're dealing with have millions of objects of interest, just individual devices. So the data set that we're dealing with is quite large. And to handle that scale over time, Forward has implemented like a number of custom storage formats and data structures to deal with that 
And GraphQL is interesting because it's agnostic to the storage format and the storage engine. Unlike most SQL databases, where with a SQL database, in order to query the data, you first have to put the data in the tables, right, into its storage. And GraphQL is different, so the server implementation just requires a fetching function to be defined for every single field in the data model. And that fetching function just has to know how to get the data for that field. And otherwise, it's just arbitrary logic. So, you can, so we're able to fill in and back this data model with fetching functions that use our custom data structures. And so this eases the path for, for supporting this data set and querying at scale. OK, so GraphQL gives us the schema language, provides a good uh, query experience for our users. But what should our, our schema actually be? And we want a schema that's vendor neutral, that has broad coverage, that our users are familiar with. And we really don't want to reinvent the wheel here. And so fortunately for us, uh, the open config community, which is this group of network operators, has been working on defining a set of vendor neutral Yang models uh, for several years now. And the model covers a lot of ground. So this is an outdated picture of, uh, like, from more than a year ago. So it's, like, way out of date. But it gives you a sense of uh, the breadth of coverage of open config. They cover, you know, all this detail about interfaces, detail about routing protocols, um, and, and much more. So it covers a lot of ground. It's by no means ex exhaustive. So it's constantly being, um, there's an active community, and it's constantly being extended. But it does give us a set of high-quality operator-vetted data models to start with. So there's some differences between um, mismatches between open config and GraphQL, and we've had to make some adjustments in order to expose uh, open config structured data via GraphQL. And um, I'll just go over a few of them. So basically, the some some kind of low-level things like the naming requirements in GraphQL don't allow as much flexibility as we have in, in open config and Yang models. And so, for example, we've just camel cased. We've applied basically camel casing consistently throughout our names, and that works. Um, we've also simplified the data hierarchy a little bit um, because we're do we have a read-only data model. We're not trying to support configuration. And so we've removed some of these state and config levels that occur throughout the open config data model. So that just simplifies the hierarchy. It makes it shallower and, and easier to use. Um, we leverage some of GraphQL's graph database background, where the viewpoint of GraphQL is you've got you know, a graph viewpoint, you've got objects, you've got edges that define relationships between these things. So we take advantage of that to simplify querying. So interfaces can refer and link directly to another interface that they connect with. So things like that make it easier to um, query against. And we support paging um, over some of these large collections, and that shows up in the schema. So that's another. Uh, difference in our schemas. OK, so that's querying and normalizing. So querying via GraphQL and normalizing into open config. Um, but before we can normalize and query, we, you know, we have to collect and parse data. And um, as I mentioned, these, these are big topics. They could be talks of their own. So I'll just give you a brief glimpse of some of the surprising challenges here. And so a key challenge in parsing is just dealing with the breadth of devices. Right? We've got tens of vendors and, you know, and operating systems and hundreds of versions of OSs that we're dealing with, and the breadth of data that we want to parse and bring into our model. And to give you just a sense of, um, of how much data we have, might have to parse, um, consider this one example. So if you look at just Cisco NXOS, and you look at just the top-level config commands, so there, there's many levels within, if you go into the Cisco configuration, if you look at just the top level config commands, you'll find that there's more than 120,000 ways of combining keywords to form valid commands. Right? I've shown a little fragment of that hierarchy on the right-hand side where you, know, you could do AAA and then accounting and all kinds of things. So not all of those 120,000 combinations are really interesting to us, but a lot of them actually are. And um, even if we don't care about a lot of them, we, we at least need to be robust enough to ignore the ones that we don't care about. So to handle that scale of the parsing task, it's really critical that we have streamlined ways of ingesting text-based data into the model. So this is one of the major focus areas at Forward. And finally, collecting the data is surprisingly challenging in the real world. 
So I'll just mention a few of the, of the challenges here. Um, the first one is that um, in order to build a database and analyze a network, we have to collect data from some devices. Um, and we have to know what to collect from. Well, operators don't always have an accurate inventory of what's in their network. Right? So we may not even know we may be trying to do a collection and we may be missing devices, really crucial devices in the network. Or likewise, they have devices that are no longer in the inventory that are no longer there um, in the actual network. And so, um, and so that's a problem. And the, another related problem is topology. They may not have an accurate um, topology database and they may have turned off LLDP and CDP. So that is not, uh, often not a good uh, available source of information. And so um, since both of these are crucial for um, getting good query results, um, so we, we need to have this information and we've found it um, important to add capabilities to our platform to help operators identify these missing devices and get them added to our network, to, to the platform, and to figure out um, what their topology really is, even without those data sources. And um, a second point is that collection is often can be slow. Um, so collection, it takes time. We're SSHing into all these devices. The obvious approach is to just, you know, collect from, let's say you have a network of 10,000 devices, just collect from all of these 10,000 devices in parallel. You know, it shouldn't take too long. Well, it turns out that kind of stuff just does, the kind of naive approach just doesn't work because the infrastructure is complex. So we might have things like jump servers. Jump servers, you have to connect into them in order to get to a bunch of other devices those jump servers can get overloaded. And so we have to be smart about how we collect without overloading uh, the infrastructure and while still doing it fairly quickly. Um, and finally, at this scale of tens of, tens of thousands of, network, of devices, failures are common. And so we've had to engineer our, our collection to be robust to all these weird failures that we see um, and also yeah, to um, help operators quickly diagnose and fix those problems. So NQE is fairly new. We announced this in January of this year. And so it's an active area for us. We continue to evolve and improve it um, in two ways in particular. So we're always expanding the data set. We've ex exposed a lot of the data that we have, but not all the data that we collect. And uh, certainly, we don't cover all of open config uh, data models. So this is an area that we, we continue to add as needed. And the second point is that we're looking at ways to continue to simplify the user experience here. So currently, um, any kind of complex logic uh, beyond the kind of very simple filtering is done in external scripts. So you use these GraphQL queries and then write a script. And since our network operators are not necessarily programmers, that can be a burden, that can be a challenge. So we're looking at how we can simplify that even more. Um, so that's forward NQE, and we're really excited to see what the community does with it. Um, so if you um, operate a complex network and want to query it, come talk to us. If you are interested in this kind of work, it's, it's active for us, so um, come talk to us as well. Nikhil Handigal, one of our founders at Forward, is here as well, so please come find us after the talk and say hi. Thanks. Is yeah, Forward Enterprise. So we have uh, just a few minutes for a couple of questions. Anything? Yeah, sure. Hey. Um, so you said that 80% of the work is parsing and collecting this data, right? And it's a continued effort because versions change and you have to do this again. So am I guessing correctly that are you offering this as a subscription? that you pay monthly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nikhil, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so there's, well, I mean, like, uh, talking about the product itself, there's a trial version of the product, but yes, the, the enterprise version of the product is offered as a subscription, so that we take on the burden of collecting and parsing these data accurately and continue to support it. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was just going to say, as somebody that's operated large networks for decades, you undersold the problem space. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't know if you in intended it this way too, but this also is kind of a, a big pitch for, for why having these next generation interfaces makes oh, yeah. a lot of sense. Um, and also SDN in general. I mean, having a, a view of the topology of your FIB, all, all of this stuff yes. in a control plane. I mean, I think that the, the big value to someone who's looking at this from the, the lens of, you know, I have an SDN or I have these new interfaces is um, this type of querying that you can do across a network without having to do the first parts of your pipeline. Um, yeah. It could still be extremely valuable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, absolutely. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks, Andreas. Thanks.